This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Three greats. Um, in the gospel that we just read, there was a great wind. And then when Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the sea, be still, there was a great calm. And then finally, when the disciples experienced it, and when Jesus asked them about their lack of faith, there was great fear. Three great things. And the progression isn't necessarily the progression we'd normally like. We could accept that there's a great conflict or great storm of some sort, and then when Jesus rebukes the wind, when Jesus settles whatever's going on, and there's this great peace, wouldn't we like what follows it to be great commitment or great confidence or great something? But the disciples didn't get it. Even after the sea was stilled and the wind stopped, the disciples were more terrified than ever. Wondering, who is this that even the wind and the sea listen to him? The disciples weren't there yet. They were relatively new at this. They'd been following Jesus around. They'd been observing him. And so when Jesus decides evidently at the drop of a hat that they're going to go across the lake at night, the disciples get kind of nervous. Now, when we think of something like that, if we were to be on the Sea of Galilee and we were to be, let's say, about four miles north of Tiberias and going across at night, we'd have lights on the shore. We'd have all sorts of things that we could see and kind of orient ourselves by. But this is 2,000 years ago. Night meant dark. Night meant you don't go out because you don't know who else is out there or what their intentions are. Night was pretty scary all by itself. And Jesus decided to go over to the other side for no particular reason right then. Now, I look at that as I, I see it as kind of a test. The storm is raging, and the disciples are afraid. And so they wake Jesus up, and Jesus calms. Jesus responds to their need. I hope he's not just responding to his need for more sleep. A response to their need and calms the sea and the waves. And you would want the disciples to say, Oh, wow, we're really safe. But instead they wonder, what's this? Who is this? It raises more questions than answers for them. But really that's okay. They're learning. They're kind of feeling this out as they go. In the Gospel of Mark, to be honest, they never really get it. But they get it more and more so that in a few chapters, Jesus will be sending them out by themselves to preach and to work the kind of power that they've seen him all by themselves or in small groups. Paul was talking to a, or was writing to a church community that he started and Paul spent a total of about 18 months with them and left them as kind of a functioning congregation after that short a time. And then he wrote them letters. Now, it didn't seem like, uh, just to be clear, Paul didn't just say, you know, it's time for me to write those Corinthians. The Corinthians wrote him and said, 
Paul, you've got to help us. There's a problem. There's this. There's that. So in his first letter, he writes them back question by question, answering everything that they'd asked. In this second letter, which comes sometimes, sometime later, he's writing because he's heard that there are folks in Corinth who are attacking him and are saying he wasn't tough enough with the Corinthians and he doesn't use the power that God's given him in the appropriate kind of ways. So he's responding not to the, in answer to their question, but he's kind of responding personally because the things that were written back to him and the things that he have heard were very personal kind of insults. So Paul's trying to take it to a different level and saying, you know, you've heard this about us, but we've done nothing to stand in your way. You have people who are uh, taking advantage of you, but I never let any of you pay my bills. I worked for myself while I was with you. And there's a lot of conversation. And he gets to the place where we are today where he kind of goes through all of the things that he's put up with for them. There's a little bit of, you know, I did this all for you and now now you're complaining. But Paul's really saying all the things that I and the people with me have suffered, we've suffered so that you all could be stronger as a community. And now it's time for you all to take ownership of that. My affections are not confused. My sense of responsibility and confidence in what I have taught you and how I have modeled the word of Jesus to you is not confused at all. If there's any confusion, it's in you. And now is the time for you to let go of that confusion and open your hearts and embrace this message. Paul was talking to more disciples. And amazingly, the disciples in Corinth hadn't got it any more quickly than the disciples of Jesus. They learned something and they test it out, they go out on their own, and they come up with different and varying kinds of responses, and they look for more guidance. And Paul gives it to them. And over the course of Mark's gospel, Jesus will be giving his disciples lots and lots of guidance. We find ourselves in some of the same kinds of circumstances um, on a different level than the, the disciples did. They were out at sea at night in a windstorm and they weren't prepared for it. They didn't even know they were going out onto the sea, but there they are. And we have all sorts of things that are affecting us. We have the things on a national or worldwide scale that get us all uh, concerned. They strike uh, at our anxiety and our need to have compassion for people who are suffering. We are concerned because we also have a sense that we do want an orderly world in some way. We want a place where there are laws that can be obeyed and should be obeyed. And so in the middle of all of this, we pray. We pray for God to show us through this. And in a sense, these disciples were in the middle of this storm and they turned to Jesus and they wanted Jesus not just to make it stop, but they wanted Jesus to eliminate all their confusion, all of their anxiety about what was going on for them as they learned, learned from Jesus. I think we want the same thing. I would love nothing better than for somehow for, you know, um, God to appear in a way that took away every disagreement, every conflict, every place where 
Millions of people are forced out of their homes because of division within their countries. I would love it if God would just come down and stand in our midst and solve every disagreement amongst Episcopalians that has some not wanting to worship with others because they don't do it the right way. Or between people in our community who are for Measure C or against Measure C. But these things have their resolution in an election. But it doesn't mean that all of our anxieties and all of our concerns are solved. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but when I see things uh, happen at the, the ballot box, sometimes I'm more afraid afterwards than I was before. What's a Christian supposed to do? Jesus didn't take away all the stress or anxiety from his disciples. He let them know that I'm right here with you. In a sense, Jesus was telling his disciples, I've got this, now go on and do what disciples do. When we have conflicts and challenges that cause us to be anxious and concerned, we want it all to go away. Anxiety and concern, the things that happen in the world, aren't going to become perfect immediately, or maybe ever. There'll always be something that's not quite right. But Jesus asks us to be the ones who are willing to stand in in the world where things aren't quite right to reach out and support and care for and speak up for and stand up for all those who are hurt by the things that aren't going the way they should. And there's one more thing that Jesus asks of us. He asks us, to stand up with each other. He asks us to figure out how do we, do we care for people who are on the wrong side of the issue? How do we do like Jesus, who calmed the storm and then still had greater expectations for his disciples, but he didn't kick them out of the boat? <laughs> Now, in Jonah, Jonah was at sea, having run away from God. And while they were at sea, a storm came up and the waves were tossing the boat so that they were afraid that the boat was going to sink. Jonah knew why the boat was having so much trouble. He says, I'm running away from God. Throw me over. Everything will be fine. The people on the boat said, no, no, that can't be right. So let's throw all the merchandise on the ship over first. They did. Storm still was there, so they said, Jonah, I guess you're right. <laughs> and so they finally threw him over, and everything calmed down. And it makes for the rest of the story, which is really quite good and powerful. But Jesus on the lake, Jesus in the storm, when the disciples still don't get it, he doesn't toss them aside. He doesn't toss them over. He works with them. He's present with them. He cares for them. As Christians who are in a world that's filled with challenges, with lots of people who are in greater misery than we can imagine, and who make a claim on us, as people of faith and people who believe that Jesus is there to calm storms. Jesus wants us to stand up and be those who speak up for him, but always remember that we care for one another, even the people we disagree with. Perhaps that's the biggest challenge that disciples have, uh, Peter figuring out how to get along with Andrew. I, I don't know how they did it. 
but they did. There were bigger disagreements than that. Peter and J um, Paul and James had big disagreements. So I would encourage us to listen to Jesus as he calms the sea and remember that he's with us in the middle of our storms and he calls us to not only respond to the great needs that are before us, but to respond and care for one another as we reach out and as we follow him. Amen.